But you know, sometimes things happen in our lives that cause us to want to worry. But he has promised that if we look to him and seek his guidance and his righteousness, that he will bring us peace and happiness. You have an opportunity this morning to give for the Combined Youth Ministries. Combined Youth Ministries includes Sunnydale Academy, Camp Heritage. Our sermon this morning, very timely that our uh, offering today would be for youth ministries. We're going to have a youth minister this morning. I'm very excited to hear what he has to say. So if you would like to contribute to the Combined Youth Ministries this morning, please mark that offering on your envelope, place it in the envelope, all the offering in the plate otherwise goes for our local church expense, which also we need to remember. Will the deacons please come forward to wait on us at this time? Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, Lord, we are just so grateful that you can bring us peace for the hope that we have in Jesus. And even though trials and troubles may befall us, that they are opportunities for us to lean heavier on you and that you will not fail us or forsake us. And even when the light grows dim and the trail grows rough, Lord, we know that you have gone ahead and walked that trail for us all the way to the cross. Help us to never forget that you are always there for us. And I ask that you will bless these offerings this morning as you did the widow's might to multiply to serve your purpose. In Jesus' holy name, amen. I've always said that uh, George might be the coolest, coolest person I know. So I praise God for you, George. Thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> I have the pleasure, um, Naomi had the pleasure of introducing Kaya a couple weeks ago. I had the pleasure of introducing myself last week, and I have more of a pleasure to uh, introducing 
my youngest to you this morning, Colby Beam. You, we all have a church family. Like when we first came into the church some 20 years ago in uh, Loma Linda, that'll kind of always be our church family because that was the church we, we were uh, baptized in, we were married in. And you guys are Colby's church family. Um, when we moved here uh, many years ago, Colby was just about one years old. And, we, and many of you can remember that little baby face. So cute. And he was just starting to grow out his beard. <laughs> um, so, uh, but each one of my kids have a special place in my heart, obviously. Kiefer being my oldest and our firstborn, and Kaya being my only daughter, and then Colby being the baby of the family. And uh, what a blessing it is to have Colby at this point in his life. God has many more things for him. Um, but one story that I'll tell you about Colby was, um, he was a very, he's very athletic, kind of like his old man. And uh, not that I look very athletic now, but I used to be. And uh, he had just finished um, a great freshman year of football at public high school. And I can remember um, thinking, boy, I would really like for him to attend Sunnydale. But I know he really loves football. And I really love football. And I love to watch him play football. And he's pretty good at it. And uh, I just remember driving one uh, home one Thursday night from basketball here. And uh, we had a, I'm not sure what spurred the conversation. But by the time we got home on that 20-minute drive, Colby had decided that the thing, those things at public high school are not that important. And he wanted to start his life at Sunnydale. And I tell you that story because it was a real transition point in Colby's life. Um, not that you cannot be successful as a Christian in a public high school, but it's a much harder road to travel. And the atmosphere at a good Christian school will help in a young man's life. And I think it's proof in Colby. Um, and I thank God for Sunnydale. I thank God for all of you here as Colby's church family. And I look forward to what the Lord has to talk to us about today. So, Colby Beam. Thank you, Dad. And uh, thank you for my family. I love you guys dearly. And thank you for my church family. Because when I think about it, I am really nothing without you guys. So, um, as you guys know, me and Kaya had went to Africa. And because of my church family, we were able to go there. Okay, now ready. So yeah, as I was saying, because of our church family, me and Kaya were able to go. And I just want to say thank you guys for your prayers and for always thinking about us because it's a whole different world there. And thank you all for coming to our dinner and supporting us and helping us with our donations. So I just want to say thank you guys for the church family. You guys really have helped us out to be who we are today. So before we get started, I'd like to ask if we have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for 
your Sabbath. I thank you for my friends and family. And Lord, I thank you for showing us unconditional love. And God, as I come and preach to you today, Lord, I ask that you please come into my heart. God, give me the words that you want to speak. And Lord, help me to remove me from self. And God, to focus all on you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, today's title of the sermon is called uh, Usio Gope. Decided to help you guys, you know, pronounce that because it's a totally different language. It's Swahili. And for maybe some people who know Swahili here, I don't know if we have any people that do, don't tell anyone what it means. <laughs> well, I'm going to, I'll tell you guys the meaning of this sermon title, you know, in a little while. Hopefully, maybe you guys will catch on. But, so, before I tell you the sermon title, I want to talk about three words. Three words that truly sometimes happen to us daily. And these three words are the A word, the S word, and the F word. And so now, before you guys think, oh, what's he going to say, I'll assure you, these are words that you probably would not have thought of. Don't worry, they're not big. You can pronounce them. It's not you see or go pay. But I want to tell you what these three words kind of mean. Because they all have the same meaning. And when I think about it, these three words really true, truly uh, tear us down in life. The first word is the S word. And that's to be scared. I know uh, looking at that toilet, I'm pretty scared. Because that's, uh, yeah, that's not a very nice toilet I would prefer to use. But yes, the S word, scare. Sometimes are we scared? Are we scared of things in our life? Are we scared of giants? Are we scared of this really disgusting toilet? The A word, afraid. Do we sometimes find ourselves being afraid? Maybe afraid of man-eating hippos? Because you know... There are things out there that we can just be so afraid of. And now the F word, fear. Are we fearful of what may happen tomorrow that we may be living in such a small bed like this to the point where our feet are hanging off? So brothers and sisters, the A word, the S word, and the F word all have the same meaning. They all mean to be frightened. And so now I ask you, are some of you guys frightened today? Do you guys have maybe fear of tomorrow? Or you guys just sometimes, every once in a while, just be afraid? I can tell you, I've been afraid many times. You know, just being in my house, I can be afraid. You know, if I, I've learned to, you know, obey my mom and dad more often now. That's a big key. But... Oh, God, help the person that does not obey them, because that is when you truly find out those three meanings of those words. But, yeah, those three words, can they really take hold of us, can they? So now let me ask you, are we afraid to do God's will? Are we sometimes scared to get out of our comfort zone? And do something that you know we should do, but we do not do because we don't want to maybe have people reject us because maybe we think, oh, God's will, I don't want to do that. I might lose some friends. I, mean, I might get rejected by them. Or I might have to change my lifestyle. So we might just live in fear of maybe just doing God's will. So brothers and sisters, I want to talk to you about being afraid to do his will. I want to tell you my story of how I had gone maybe just about 16 years of my life being afraid to do it. Being afraid to stand up and be courageous for our God. So, when I was younger, to be quite honest, I would never thought I would have been here right now doing what I'm doing. Two years from now, if someone had told me I would have gone to Africa, I would have gone to Sunnydale, I would have preached, and 24 people would have been baptized 
because I was willing to be a, a tool of God, I would have not believed you. I would have said, you are funny. You are a big liar and get out of my face because that is a total lie. Because brothers and sisters, I had never thought about that God had such a plan for me that I was totally unknowing of. And now I have a verse that I want to share with you guys. And it is in Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. And I'm starting at verse 4, and I'm going to go through 8. And this is the call of Jeremiah. Chapter 1. And it says, The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as the prophet to the nations. Ah, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I am only a child. But the Lord, came, but the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am only a child. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them. For I am with you and I will rescue you, declares the Lord. So that few verses right there just kind of says it, doesn't it? God is with us. He declares it. So why should, why should we be afraid? But unfortunately, I never got to read that verse, so I just really didn't maybe understand too much of God when I was younger. And so I was just kind of unwilling to do his will. I might have put on a good mask for everyone, but let's just say I, was, I just I didn't care much for it. There was a time in my life when maybe I was younger, and like it says in the Bible, when we must become like children. That is true, because when I was a child, I had maybe a little conviction to do God's will. And I stepped out of my comfort zone a little bit. But as I started growing up, I started to man, like, realize, oh, I don't want to stand up for Jesus and be rejected by my friends. What will they say to me? What will they do to me? Will they have an opinion? And will they say, you can't be hanging out with us anymore? Or maybe it'll just take me out of my comfort zone. But even then, God was still wrestling for my heart. Even then, God was still telling me, or still kind of coming at me and wanting me. He tried his best. And so now, I want to tell you guys the, 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 the scripture reading that we had read today. Hebrews 13, 6. And it says, so we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? So there it is again, another Bible verse that we can find that says, what can man do to us? What can our friends say to us to put us down? And then it tells us not, again, do not be afraid. But unfortunately to me, I was used to being afraid. I was used to having fear in my heart and always being scared. But then there was a game changer. And there was a small spark that had started my reconnection with God. And that was the first semester of my sophomore year. And as my father had told you on the way from coming back from basketball, that one night, and we were in the car for 20 minutes, and for some reason, God called my heart to go to Sunnydale, because I saw what the people there had, and I wanted it. I saw that they were always happy, and I wanted it. I saw they were always smiling, and I was like, man, why can't I get some of that? Why can't I find this at public school with all my wacko friends? And I realized that what I was doing before, that's no fun. 
that wasn't the true fun that could put a smile on my face. I had realized that Jesus was the one who could truly do it. And I had found that through Sunnydale. And I want to tell you guys, that might have been the best decision I've ever made in my life. Because there, that is when I reconnected with God. That was where God had pulled and tugged at my heart. And so I had gone to Sunnydale the second semester of my sophomore year. And it was a big transition. Was I still a little afraid? Yeah, I was. A whole new school, new friends. Hey, we had different classes. They even had Bible class. I didn't even know you could have a class like that there. But I tell you, it was a great experience. And so as the second semester of my sophomore year was ending, I had, uh, well, that was actually the time when Kai had gone back to Africa. And, well, it was actually in the middle of it. But still, as the second semester of my sophomore year had ended, I saw the pictures that Kai had taken from Africa, and I saw what they had done, and I was like, man, that looks pretty interesting. Mission trips and going overseas. I was like, yeah, I, I think I'll give that a try. I'll see uh, what I can do in Africa. I'll... So I just made the decision to, over the summer, like, I'm going to go to Africa. And I, think, I guess God had called my heart to go there. And once again, I said thank you for my church family. Because it wasn't for you guys, we would not have been able to go on. And so, as the summer was ending, we had started raising up the money for Africa. And, uh, you know, school started up again, and we were probably maybe midway of the first semester, actually maybe towards the end. Pastor Scott, the missions coordinator, the director of all missions, comes to me and says, well, he doesn't come to me, he comes to the Africa group, all the people that are going, and he says, we're going to need a preacher. And to be quite honest, I was uh, not a fan of that. Uh, as, as of then, I, was, uh, I really didn't want to do that. I just wanted to go work. I was like, because that's what Africa was for. It was just for working. And before, you know, he had told us to, uh, we didn't need a preacher, I, I had done a PTO for uh, Sunnydale, which, is, uh, pray, which we call Praise the Lord, and we do that every Wednesday night, and there's someone, you know, anyone can go up there and, you know, just talk, maybe con uh, uh, a testimony or just something about Jesus. And so I had done one of those. And I was, that was just a one and done for me, I thought. I was like, yeah, oh, one time, that's, that's good enough. One PTL, one little praise the Lord snippet, and then I'll be good. But, you know, then, yeah, like I said, Pastor Scott comes to the whole group and says, well, you need a preacher. And I had said no to him many times. I was like, ha, ah, no, that's not, that's not going to happen. I am, um, like I said, well, I didn't tell it to his face, but like those three words I was talking about, fear, scared, or afraid, I was all three of those. I was thinking to myself, man, I am not going to do that. Preach to people that probably don't even understand what I'm saying and go out of my comfort zone, way out of my comfort zone, and talk about, well, actually do maybe this many sermons because this is how thick the sermon book was. So, oh, there I was again, afraid, scared to do God's will. But God works miracles, does he not? He knows our plans when we are totally oblivious to them. And so, as the first semester was ending, and the second semester was going to start up again, which was uh, maybe, a, maybe a, let's see, one month in the, in the sem first, second semester, like February or March that we had left for um, Africa. I think it was actually February. And so, yeah, second semester was starting up again. We still didn't have a preacher. And I don't know what was going on in my heart, but God had maybe had a, well, he was obviously convicting me to go, but I was resisting him. But maybe as the second semester started up again, I don't know what happened, but there was a spark again. There was a little flame in my heart, and I was like, man, maybe I do want to preach. Maybe I do want to, go to Africa and, you know, give the, spread the word of the Lord. But being afraid again, I didn't tell anybody. I just kind of kept it to myself. I didn't tell, tell Pastor Scott. I was just uh, kind of, like I was just in the back of my head. I'll, I don't think much of it. But like I said, God works miracles now. And so 
maybe like just maybe a month before you're about to leave, maybe a month and a half. Some uh, man, uh, one of the guys that goes to our school named Nate Allman, he decided he was going to preach. And I was like, oh, okay, good for him, you know, good job. And so maybe a week goes by, maybe not even then. He comes to me. And remember, I told, I, I'm telling you guys, I didn't tell anyone that I wanted to preach. You know, I was just in the back of my head, and I was like, yeah, whatever. But Nate comes to me, and he says, hey, Colby, I think you want to preach, so you can go out and preach. And that was our conversation. And so I'm like, he's walking away. I'm like, my mouth is like, are you kidding me? Like, I didn't tell you I wanted to preach. What, what, what just happened? And so I was baffled. I was mind blown. But I was like, hey, maybe God wants me to do his will. So it was not mostly because I had overcome fear, but because God had gave someone else a nudge to make a bigger plan. So I get the sermons, and this is when I get really scared, because like I told you, they're like this thick of paper. And I'm like, oh my, that's a novel. That is a novel I have to preach in 14 days. Wow. But God has started that spark in my heart, and so I went over them. I had a, maybe a total of maybe 48 hours of going over those sermons while I was in Africa and before I went. And so, God had already told you the details how we got to Africa, so I'll spare you the details. But we had left and we had gotten there. And I want to say it was bad. I, well, then I would have had said it was bad luck would have happened, but now I would have said, praise the Lord what had happened there. Because as we had started, you know, we were going to start preaching, they had told me that my translator was not going to be there, my original translator. And he was already, uh, I want to say, a Christian, a godly man. And so I'm kind of like a little frantic. I'm like, really? We don't have a translator? How are they going to, how are they going to understand what I'm saying? You know, I'm going to find as well preach to a wall. But <laughs> no, they had told me, they were like, oh, um, don't worry, we found another translator. And I think they found him off the street, I don't know. But they found another translator, and he was not a believer. And so this had made things a little difficult to preach on the Bible and um, have a translator that doesn't know pretty much what he's talking about. And so, actually, well, this is not where I preached. This is just a little hut that uh, people had stayed in Africa just to kind of get you guys a little image of Africa. But no, here is my translator, Mr. Paul. And so he was a non-believer. And so there was some bad luck I thought. You know, I was like, oh, wow, this is going to be rough. But then I also forgot, you know, when you go to Africa, you know, the people there, they don't uh, really understand much of, you know, they have a good grasp of the Bible, and they don't have a good grasp of history. And on well, fortunately, or on, well, for me, I thought it was unfortunate then, but I had to preach about prophecy. And those are two big factors when you preach about prophecy, is to have, you know, history, you know, kind of have history down of what's going on, and then also have a good knowing of the Bible. And so, let's just say the first maybe four to five sermons were a doozy. They were a little rough. But I want to say it was, I want to say it was the sixth sermon. There was the spark. The sixth sermon, that is when I want to say that was the game changer. Because before that, me and Mr. Paul had no chemistry. Our sermons were dull and dry, and I highly doubt it maybe people weren't getting much out of them. Because neither were I, no, I wasn't. But when that sixth sermon comes around, that's that's when God worked the miracle. And so like I, I told you, Mr. Paul, he said he was a non-believer. But he had said before all the sermons had started that he was willing to give our God a chance. And so I kind of made it my plan and my decision, like, okay, God, let's teach him a few things. Man, God humbled me then. 
Because I thought I was going to teach Mr. Paul a few things, but man, he taught, he taught me something. So here I was in the sixth sermon. I was sitting on my little stool, going over my sermon, kind of recapping what was going on. And I bet to everyone I looked like a scared little boy. Because, man, I was a little nervous. I was like, man, we're, we're not doing so hot. We're talking about things that I don't know if they're understanding. Me and Mr. Paul have no chemistry. What's going to happen? So there I am in my chair, well, my little stool. And here comes Mr. Paul. And he walks up to me. And he tells me one word. Usio gope. And I want to tell you what that means. It means do not be afraid. Never could I have thought that one word could have changed my life. Because when I thought about it when I was younger, I had been so scared to do God's will that maybe I could have hopefully changed people's lives, but I was too afraid to do so. That maybe I could have changed one boy's life before he he had taken his life. I'd been living in the darkness. I had thought I'd been living in the life, in the light. But I was completely wrong. And so then that day, God had used Paul to tell me something. To say, Colby, wake up. Stop being afraid. Have no fear. God is with us. You shouldn't be in the dark because he's holding your hand and he's trying to get you out of the lights. So don't be afraid to do his will. Men have nothing against you. God is stronger. God will take care of you no matter what. I want to read you a Bible verse in, this, in Psalms 20, chapter 27, verses 1 through 3. And it says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evil men advance against me to devour my flesh, when my enemies and my foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, and my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then will I be confident. One thing I ask of the Lord is that this what I seek, that I might dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek Him in His temple. So brothers and sisters, that was my problem. I wasn't living in the light. I was too busy being afraid. I was too busy focusing on my own selfish desires of being afraid to step out of my comfort zone. I was afraid that people would reject me and say, Kobe, I don't want to be your friend. Look at you. You think you're all holier than me? But no. It says that Lord is the light whom our salvation, and that even though men may try to devour our flesh and that enemies may besiege us, we should be confident and have no fear. So if the Bible says that, we should believe it because that's coming from God. We shouldn't be afraid of people. We should have a stronghold in Jesus Christ. So brothers and sisters, after Paul had told the Usio Gope, that was when everything happened. We had started preaching better. We started preaching with courage. We had, I, I could even see Mr. Paul. He was getting a little spark himself. He was standing there using his hand motions. He was getting excited. 
And, you know, here I am preaching. He's right next to me holding the mic. And after I would say something, he would translate it, and he would stand up a little farther than me and kind of rave his hands around and tell, point at people and tell them the truth. And then think about this. This was a non-believer a week ago. This is a guy who said, you know what? I'm a non-believer, but I'll give it a try. And that, is, I, that was a miracle. God worked on his heart, and he worked on mine. And I could see in Mr. Paul's eyes that he had wanted something. And that I think he had found it. Because we had let God work through us. We had let him come in our lives and have us stop being afraid to get out of our comfort zone and to stop being afraid to preach with courage and to stop being afraid of maybe Satan might throw evil things at us. But we still need to be courageous. Brothers and sisters, God is where we get our courage from. And now I want to talk to you or tell you that about what had happened in Africa. That was a true miracle. Most of you might say, I've seen beautiful things before. I've seen the Grand Canyon. I've seen Niagara Falls. I, I don't know. I've seen something really pretty. I've seen a, a dove. I don't know what you guys want to call as pretty. But I want to say the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life is when 23 others and Mr. Paul got baptized. I had never seen something as amazing as that. And all that glory came to God. I was just a willing tool. Guys, two years ago, I had never thought that I could do something great for God. I was too scared. But God, he changed my plans, did he not? He humbled me and told me, Colby, I want you to go on my path, not your own. And so, there was Mr. Paul getting baptized. And so now I'm starting to realize that we need to be the light. Amen. That no matter what happens, no matter what darkness comes to us, we shouldn't be afraid and we need to be the light. And that when people, or maybe when God may sh have people come into our lives that are in the wrong, that have maybe done bad things, don't be afraid to reach out to them. Don't be afraid because what people will think of you. Don't be afraid that they may reject you. Because it says in James chapter 5, verses 19 through 20, My brothers, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring him back, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save him from death. You catch that? Will save them from death. We can let God work through us and save a person from themselves and save them from dying we can save them so that they may have eternal life and live forever with God. And it goes on, it says, and will cover over a multitude of sins. Only if we're willing, only if we let God work on our hearts and truly have courage in our hearts to let God work in us, we can help save others for the kingdom. And that's what I hold on to. And that's why, I want, that's why I aspire to be a pastor now. And you know, when I think about Paul and all the people that I saw get, get baptized, I think, yeah, I might not see, ever see them again in this world. But oh, glory be the day when I see them in heaven. And it's all because... 
God has a relentless struggle for us. It's because he's struggling for our hearts every single day. And he doesn't give up on us. I never thought I would have assumed I kind of stepped in the light just because of one of Mr. Paul coming to me, a non-believer, and saying one word. Usio Gope. Thank you. Closing song, let's open our hymnals to 362, page 362, Lift High the Cross. Shall we stand?
pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for all the great things that you can do in our lives. And God, I ask that you please come into everyone's heart. God, I ask you to reside in there and give us not fear, but Lord, courage to do your will every day. To not have fear, Lord, of what may come to us. But Lord, have the promise that you have given to us that we shall live in the light no matter what. Thank you, Lord, for preaching through me today. And all the glory goes to you. Amen.